I was born in Erie, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania. Hammond Hospital. <laughs> but in 1929 or 30, he was laid off in the Great Depression. And my mother's parents lived in Faulkner, New York. So they packed us all up and we moved back to the old homestead, essentially down uh, east of Faulkner to, well, actually Levant, New York. I got to know Jeannie then and we went through all of the Faulkner school system, graduated together in a class of 42. I was 17 and was facing the draft board in Jamestown and I knew I would be a 1A <laughs> material. So I said to my folks, you know, I don't anticipate a service crawling around on my belly in the mud. I would rather be in the Navy, I think. So my dad and I got on the Greyhound bus at the Jamestown bus depot and we rode to Buffalo, New York, where I met uh, with a Navy recruiting officer and went through the physical exam and the rest of the exam to apply for what was then called the Navy V-12 program. The Navy had a surface officer fleet training program called V-12. They had the air officer program was called V-5. So I came home uh, in March and subsequently received a letter in the mail that I had been accepted in the Navy V-12 program. So on July 1st, 1943, I had then turned 18 and I had a set of orders to report to St. Lawrence University in Canton, New York, which I did. And we were up there from July 1st to the following July 1st. So July 1st found me on a train heading to South Bend, Indiana. And we subsequently uh, finished that program and graduated on October 26, 1944. I was commissioned an ensign. And on that afternoon, uh, Jeannie and I were married in South Bend. Uh, strangely enough, I was old enough to have a commission in the United States Navy, but I still had to get my mother's permission to get married. And that was a bit of a trial for her. She didn't know, she thought I was much too young to get married. It was all right that I could go off to war, but she didn't think I should undertake the rigors of marriage. Well, just this week, Jeannie and I celebrated our 61st anniversary, so I think that was a, a move with some merit. On the 26th, I held a set of orders in my hand that said, you have five days travel time to reach the South Boston Navy Yard and report aboard the USS Biscayne, then classified as an AGC-18. The Biscayne was originally built in the state of Washington as a seaplane tender and she had a big boom uh, aft to lift uh, seaplanes out of the water and tend to them. They subsequently uh, converted her to an amphibious flagship to direct amphibious landings. And she was sent uh, to the Mediterranean and participated in the North African campaign, the uh, Sicily campaign, in southern France, Anzio, all of that area, and that was where she gained her first notoriety with uh, Ernie Pyle, the uh, reporter who spent several days aboard the Biscayne and then wrote his book entitled Brave Men. The Biscayne <coughs> took some near misses there, had some damage on the back or fantail of the ship, and was sent to the South Boston Navy Yard for repairs. And that's where I went aboard. We subsequently sailed out of uh, the Boston Navy Yard. Then, like I presume even today, 
things were not what they were cracked up to be. We left the South Boston Navy Yard with one engine that worked. We had one water filtration system that worked. We had one main engine that worked and we had one five inch mount that worked and the rest was left up to the crew to fix underway. Uh, fortunately, we had a terrific crew aboard the Biscayne and by the time we got to the Panama Canal, we had two engines running, we had two distillers running, all the uh, armament aboard was firing as it was designed to do. And we proceeded through the canal and up the west coast to San Francisco to Vallejo where we took on a load of uh, ammunition and then departed for Hawaii. And were subsequently dispatched in a flotilla to go north to attack uh, Iwo Jima. February of 1945, an epic confrontation took place on an eight-mile strip of land in the middle of the Pacific Ocean called Iwo Jima. The only value of the island was its strategic airstrip located just 625 miles southeast of Tokyo. I remember being junior officer aboard. I was allowed to take uh, watch at night and we were traveling uh, in this armada, we had to do zigzagging, and the zigzag was orders were transmitted by uh, flashing lights, and you had to use binoculars to uh, interpret whether you were going to zig right or zig left. <laughs> and I remember one morning we were probably 200 miles from uh, Iwo, and this voice came on the radio. It was Tokyo Rose. And she proceeded to say, well, boys, turn back before it's too late. We know where you're going, and we know who's in your armada. And she proceeded to name several of the ships that were traveling with us. That's all for now, enemies. But there'll be more of the same tomorrow night. Until then, this is Orphan Anne, your number one enemy, reminding me, G.I., always to be good. Goodbye now. I had been sent to... Uh, the office uh, in Hawaii to pick up this black book. It was top secret. Those were the invasion orders for Iwo Jima, and we were given strict orders. We were not to open this until we were underway for the exact uh, time of the invasion. Well, anyway, she proceeds to tell us the names and even some of the crew members on uh, the ships in the Armada, which was uh, sort of unnerving to say the least. We but did uh, arrive off Iwo Jima. There was a tremendous bombardment, both by air and by fleet. Uh, the battleships, the cruisers, you know, the destroyers, everybody, the they had uh, the, the, the LCI, the landing craft the morning that carried rockets, the LCRs, the rockets. everybody was pounding that uh, black sand beach. A and on the first on morning, the morning we were off thinking. the Nobody island. The first thing we this. noticed, of course, was Mount better. Suribachi. And that was sort of the reference point for everything that went on there and the we were as one their command carrier planes a ship for the uh, one of the beaches to get all the landing craft in the correct order and on the correct beach with the correct material and of course there's chaos in Sue's in war <laughs> but we did get the thing done that was my first experience of enemy hostile fire, and I've often uh, thought of Churchill's quote in the war when he said, there is no feeling quite so thrilling as having been shot at and missed. And we went in to shore for close combat support, firing on uh, these pillboxes that they had buried in the side of the mountain. And being a kid, 
I can look back now and have to smile to myself, you know, but I said to the captain, gee, captain, do we have to be this damn close? <laughs> we were, you know, but a few yards off the beach, and he said, yes, damn it. <laughs> In about the fourth day, we saw the flag uh, go up on Mount Suribachi. And strangely enough, uh, all the mail that we received and sent on board ship was censored. And I remember writing to Jeannie, uh, I said, you may see a picture in a magazine of a flag being raised. And I saw it today. And I didn't say any more, and the censor let it go through. <laughs> and lo and behold, uh, the following week, there was a small picture came out in Life magazine of this flag being raised on Mount Suribachi. She knew where we were. Not that that was any great comfort, I guess. You know, that was a horrific scene there. There's been a lot of movies written about, or books written about it, movies made of it. Uh, and it's hard for words to describe. Uh, I've read since, you know, some of the people said, well, you know, you, you have to have been there to <laughs> appreciate what went on. But that was our first introduction to the divine wind or floating chrysanthemums or kamikazes, whatever name you want to put on the suicide uh, missions. But after... Uh, Did you get much advance notice to the kamikazes? I mean, was there enough? Was there radar? Or no. Uh, we had radar, but it was very limited range. And most of the time, uh, <laughs> you saw them coming. That was your notice. Mm -hmm. we, we did have radar, and it went out I've forgotten now, but maybe it was 30,000 yards or something. It wasn't a terrific amount of time, you know, from the time they were, you know, they called them bogeys. They would report bogeys on the radar screen. Back then was the first that I knew that we had <coughs> a system called IFF that our aircraft used. It was called identification, friend or foe. And we were supposed to be able to tell the good guys from the bad guys. Sometimes that worked, sometimes it didn't. <laughs> There's this thing known in war, a euphemism as friendly fire. Mm -hmm. Well, that occurred on occasion. Anyway, they sent us back to uh, Luzon in the Philippines. Uh, we had heard rumors that Ernie Pyle was uh, back in the Pacific. Ernie Pyle came aboard, so we had three correspondents aboard the Biscayne. I remember him. He was rather short. He was wiry. He had a little crooked smile, uh, but, and he was dressed in uh, combat fatigues, but very unassuming individual. You wouldn't know but what he'd just come out of the cook mess, you know? I mean, he was, was not a commanding presence but he immediately put you at ease. You didn't feel like you were in the presence of a, an international figure uh, at that time anyway. But as I say, he w was well known on the Biscayne from the time that he had spent with them in the Mediterranean. We were given an assignment to go and take this small group of islands called Iyashima and we'd been there, I think, maybe overnight, and we had put ashore a contingent of Marines, and they had cleaned up, I think, probably about a little better than half the island, maybe two-thirds of the island. And I was at breakfast this morning, and Ernie Pyle came up and sat down, had a cup of coffee, and said, boy, I want to go ashore and see what's going on over there. And I looked at him and I said, well, if you want to go, who's going to tell you no? And 
he sort of had this smirk on his face, you know, about, well, I guess if I want to go, I'm going to go. Uh, everyone had pleaded with him, really, not to expose himself uh, anymore. He'd, you know, been through all of that campaign in Europe and had had numerous narrow escapes with his life. But anyway, he seemed to sense that he had this mission that he had to do. And the next thing I knew, I had heard that he had gone over the side with a contingent and would, had gone ashore. On April 17th, Pyle went ashore at Iyashima, a few miles northwest of Okinawa. The Army's 77th Division had taken an enemy airstrip there a few hours before. And now the island was mercifully quiet. Pyle spent the afternoon and evening talking with infantrymen, bedded down in an ammunition storage bunker for the night, and in the morning hitched a ride in a jeep headed across the island. At about 10 o'clock, a Japanese machine gunner opened fire on the jeep. Pyle and the other men scrambled into a ditch. A moment later, just as Pyle raised his head, the gunner fired another burst hitting him in the left temple. He died almost instantly. He was buried with his helmet on in a long row of soldiers' graves on the island of Iishima. Later, a crude marker would be posted at the gravesite. At this spot, the marker read, the 77th Infantry Division lost a buddy. Then I guess the next morning that uh, we got word that Ernie Pyle had been shot by a machine gunner and had died. And I remember being in the wardroom when uh, Don Pryor came up and broadcast this statement back to the states about Ernie Pyle. And we had a, a newspaper we published on the Biscayne called The Busy Bee, and we printed up Don Pryor's uh, broadcast to the States, and I was fortunate enough to get a copy of that. I still have it. This is Don Pryor off the coast of Okinawa. Ernie Pyle was killed yesterday morning by a Japanese machine gun sniper. This was going to be his last operation. That's what he said when we left Guam. And he wasn't going to go ashore this time until later, after the hard fighting was over. He hadn't been feeling well. And besides, for a long while, even before he left Europe and went home for his long rest, as he said, he hadn't been too convinced that his luck hadn't run out. He didn't get much rest at home. He wasn't the resting kind. Early this year, he came out here to the Pacific and tried his conscientious best to report this war as he had the war in Europe, where he became what someone called the GI's walking delegate. It was because, out of his simple honesty, sympathy, and understanding, he knew the great worth of plain people and wrote about them with the respect and admiration they deserve. Not many people who are called great have the deep humility that requires, that this requires. Ernie Pyle did. He was unhappy for several months out here because this was a new kind of war to him. He had been used to the foxholes of Europe, the long, dull, unbroken misery and the kind of superb bravery that keeps men working and fighting for months on end without any comfort. Out here, his first experience was what seemed to him a kind of holiday cruise on board a carrier, where the men had clean clothes all the time, clean warm bunks to sleep in, excellent food, books to read, and movies to see now and then. 
and even ice cream was made whenever they wanted it. Besides, wherever he went, he was treated like a visiting celebrity. He was the guest of admirals and captains, and an officer attended him. He was given special quarters all to himself at headquarters. How the devil can I make this seem like a war when I don't even see any war? That was his greatest concern, which he confided to the rest of us correspondents and which worried him. So this, he said, he wanted to go with the Marines, just one more operation so he could see for himself that there was a war in the Pacific, too. It's not that he didn't appreciate the valor or bravery of men who fight at sea. It's just that he didn't see any fighting at sea. All he had seen was the great contrast between a carrier's comfort and a foxhole's miseries. So he went ashore here, spent some time with the Marines on Okinawa, but he told several people that he was afraid he was going to get it this time. He was urged to take it easy, and he promised that he would. He kept the promise, too. He went aboard the flagship on the invasion of Iwashima day before yesterday, and that was the Biscayne. He didn't go ashore until two-thirds of the island was supposed to be secure. And this morning, he went out with Lieutenant Colonel Joseph B. Coolidge, the commanding officer of a regiment, for a tour of the battalion command posts. Far behind the front, they came to a crossroad. A machine gun opened fire, and they jumped out of their jeep and dived into a ditch beside the road. After a while, Ernie and the colonel raised up together and peered over the edge of the ditch. The Jap fired again. He had been hiding in a clump of trees near nearby for two days, just waiting. Ernie was killed instantly, with three bullets through the side of his head. The colonel was not scratched. Several hours later, an army photographer crawled 125 yards on his stomach and left a chaplain and four volunteer litter bearers who brought the body back to headquarters. Ernie, I know you wouldn't want to feel, us to feel that your death was a greater loss than the deaths of the least private. Perhaps he would be right about that, too, as he was about so many things that mattered. But his death will be felt as a great loss by privates all over the world. This is Don Pryor off the coast of Okinawa. I return you now to the United States of America. That was on April 19th, 1945. Well, it was a great sense of loss. Uh, you know, the people that had been with him, particularly in the Mediterranean uh, had gotten to know him much better than we had. He'd only been on board the ship a couple days uh, this time. So, but it was a sense that we had lost a true friend. You must remember it was a combat zone and every day was a challenge to uh, stay alive. And you didn't do a lot of worrying about morale. I mean. We were well aware we'd lost our commander-in-chief. Uh, being a kid, I thought, well, what the heck, he was 62. I mean, how old do you want to live to be? <laughs> but uh, now being 80, I look back at that <laughs> with a little di a different perspective. Morale was uh, maintained at a high level. We had a great cohesive force aboard ship. I mean, we knew that each and every one of us depended on the person next to him to survive. And we accepted uh, Ernie's loss as one of the casualties of war. I mean, that was sort of an everyday occurrence out there. Uh, it was tragic in that 
he was a well-known uh, figure of uh, international fame, but in, as he indicated, he didn't consider his loss any greater than that of the least private, to put it in his words. I probably was one of the last people that sat down and had a meal with him. That's correct.